recording is on. Okay, hello. Uh, today is um, uh, the meeting number 60 of the Desiderata Extinctionality, uh, and it's the 27th of June. Uh, so the, the topics uh, today are open, and uh, Gary, we will have our... Okay. Okay. Well, any questions or anybody got anything from the last meeting? Which, by the way, is private, but send me an email if you want to see it, anybody. The last meeting, the last meeting was with Spencer McCall, really, wasn't it? Ah, yes. Okay, the one before. before we'll get to, we've got to talk about him, but we, yeah, the one before. The one before was... Uh, the uh, what is... I'm not sure what happens next. Are you going to get in contact with Faulty next? Or or what do we... What happens? Yeah, if everybody reviews that document and it's okay, then I will... I'll send them an email and just say, here it is, uh, what you asked for. And then let's have another meeting, I think. Could we talk about the review? Okay, so you, you haven't had any contact with him since the last time we spoke. No, yeah, that's right. Yeah, I thought I just had one action item and that was to, you know, do some examples and stuff, so. So Hopefully who has read the, who has, Gary, you've read the document? I've read it today, and I don't know if you have read it through Gary and any other body online that Tom, I think. Yeah. Mike is not here, yes, so you, wait for Mike, you see. You. Uh, um, I, I sent you a couple of small things. Um, so he's got, he's got the corrections that I was interested in. Um, uh, it, um, so basically, Hugh, you, you haven't, I, th I thought that you, Seem to be terribly busy. I thought you were actually in contact with him, but you haven't. You haven't been in contact with him since we spoke. And this, no, I've just concerned. been writing that document. But yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you you were, you were so quiet. I thought, oh my god, I I, I was assuming that uh, you'd contacted him again, and the two of you were, were very busy, you know. But I can see now that you are writing the document. Yeah. No. Um, uh, yeah. I was just. Yeah. I mean, there's like I don't know. 21 and 22 pages. <laughs> so, <laughs> and you've edited the you've edited the video of Spencer McCall. You took out the piece because he didn't want to have on. Do you yeah, my piece. Yeah, that, yeah. That yeah I checked that. Oh, go on. Yeah. You mean? <laughs> no, because he didn't. So want can that. I send you a private message? Well, there was he. He accidentally <laughs> boxed one or two people, and so we had to cut it out. Yeah. Um, I, by the way, what he docks was this uh, interview with Tucker Carlson um, and him. And so I couldn't find the Tucker Carlson interviews. If anybody finds it, then just stick it up there. Because basically they were doing a prank on Tucker Carlson. Apparently it worked. But I couldn't, I couldn't find it. So. Okay. Um. Yeah. Uh, well, I do. Uh, you, what do you want to do? Talk. There's probably not much to say about quality then. Uh, if you've just got to send your your uh, yep. document. 
Yeah, um, Sunday and, then and, and, I, and we'll talk meeting. about. Yeah, so we'll we'll deal with that again uh, when when he uh, gets back to you, I guess. Yeah. Yep. Um, I w I was intrigued because in the McCall the discussion, it got down to a certain point where we are now. You know, we're talking about uh, the 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 uh, you know. Jeff Hull was financing the um, uh, the Jejun Institute and all this kind of thing. Um, uh, no, not the the latitude was the one that cost him a heap of no, money. He apparently, does, yeah, yeah. He, did, he did the yeah, whole lot. Yeah, yeah. He used to go behind the scenes. Yeah. So, I don't, I, uh, what's the story of Jeff Hull? I mean, I, I don't actually know anything about him. Is it worthwhile talking well, about him? He, He's actually, well, they call him a trust fund kid, but if you call him a trust fund kid, he gets very upset. Um, okay. he, he made his money from an algorithm. His dad was an algorithmic trader, had an algorithmic trading um, company, and he sold it for about $500 million. Um, Oh, I see. I think yeah. Jeff Howe was working at the company and had, had stock in the company, so... He says that's where his money comes mm. from, but uh, yeah, um, I'm, I think there's money from Seagram somewhere. From maybe I'm mixing him with something, but this I think there's originally money from the Seagrams family. But anyway, he's he's independently wealthy, and so this is kind of his passion project during during these yeah, things. Yeah, I see. Yeah, mm. yeah. He's 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 cagey. You can see in interviews. That he's, he's he will fess up to as much as the interviewer, you know, presses him on. But if I, the interviewer is just you know like, oh, nice little art project, then he goes nice little. Art. <laughs> but if you go a little bit deeper, you can see basically it's what Spencer McCall said. He said that Jeff Hall just says, you know, what's behind the curtain? He says another curtain. <laughs> it's just deeper and deeper. But he's he's doing you know esoteric cults. Social change. In the, the, same we in are, the yeah. interview that he gave in the middle of the documentary, The Institute, it was done in 2012, I think, he mentioned somewhere around the interview, just I think it's like a slip of the tongue, but he, he says, when I was ill or when I was sick, and I, it's, I don't know, he, I, I think he had an interruption for health reasons. I just yeah, wanted to put that I think picture. so, that's right. Because that could be also... Yeah. A reason why he's very recluse. We don't know everything about private background, but there could be some something. Yeah. Else. I, I I picked it up twice. I put it, played it back again, and he mentioned to mention it on a on a big documentary like that was going to be public. It might mean a lot to him. I don't know. It might be in the past because that was done nine years ago. So it's you know it might be just uh, not relevant. I don't. Know. I might be making up stuff, but I think he might have survived cancer. Yeah. Mm. Mm -hmm. Well, because he had no hair and he mentioned yeah. illness and stuff like that, I thought, oh, he's young. And, you know, I thought maybe there could have been something like it, like that. Yeah. That That's, I, I think there is something about him. But, but, yeah, I would so love to get a few conversations with uh, Jeff Hull going. Um, but he, he doesn't do interviews anymore. It would be kind of special to get to him. But I think we can eventually get to him. Um, if Jordy Aitken and stuff is also interesting. We've still got an interview with him, hopefully. Um, okay. But they, they're all on the same trip. Did you look at the stuff in Bright Axiom and the Latitude Society? I looked I looked at the last, some of the Latitude Society things, but um, I must say I've, I've got a list of things to to watch and links that I haven't explored that will give me <laughs> work for the next couple of weeks <laughs> at the rate I'm going. Um, yeah, yeah, so Spencer McCall was quite forthcoming because, you know, what they were playing with with the Latitude Society, they were playing with cults. So I wasn't really sure how, how far we would go down the cult conversation, but, we, you know, amazingly, yeah, we did, we did say, you know, the same thing, I think, that you, there's such a thing as a beneficial cult and you should use it. Um, so... Yeah, the number of threads that would be so nice if we could pull them all together it would be really, really powerful. I think if we can get the ball rolling, there's a lot of opportunity in because 
there's so many of these things like that. Do you see that that store that uh, in Arizona in Area 15, <laughs> which Meow Wolf did? I watched that video and the the fridge, the cooling fridge that opens, yeah. and you go into that yeah. that thing. It's it's fascinating. So mm. there are a lot of stuff like that all over America. Um, in fact, the that thing you posted with the Rosa Christians. Um, yeah, I've been to that place in San Jose. It's all, it has all fantastic artifacts and some Egyptian artifacts and stuff in it. Um, but, you know, I, I kind of think everybody on the left thinks the same way. Well, I mean, a, a certain section thinks the same way. So it's, it's kind of been hijacked by wokeism and all this bullshit. Um, but there, I think there is a genuine vein to tap there where... I'm convinced if you went to you know that that store, Mega Mart and stuff, and you, and you know they have a closed-ended ARG experience, and I'm sure they would love to feed into a bigger ARG and you know there was the climate movement or something like that because there's a tremendous a force that you know that could be assembled and marshaled for just Team Human. It's, the day is coming when basically people will align for Team Human. And so, yeah, I, I can see that there's a wealth of opportunity to, to tap into just approaching these people and saying, you know, if we just fit it all together, stick it under the umbrella of an odd, um, I think everybody will get it. It would be tremendously powerful. for Mainly because the government doesn't understand it. The government would not be, you know, because one of its its great points is that we're really fighting Vogons, and Vogons have zero imagination. They're selfish, egocentric narcissists with zero imagination. So they cannot understand group coordination, collective mind, you know, this group intelligence just baffles them. They're like, you know, they don't work together with anybody. So. It looks like magic to them when whole sections of the population just completely understand each other and move. And it's scary as fuck for them. They're petrified with it because, you know, they have no antidote to it. They, it, it seem, they can't even define it. So if you think of like Pretty Patel and you know, nutcases like her, she, she just wants to do, do policing. And so, you know, she's thinking like a Vogan, she's a bureaucrat. So she just wants draconian powers to crush anybody on the street. And so, you know, you know if, if traditional activism is refined and it becomes fluid and worn and basically, they'll be petrified because they, they won't even be able to define what a protest is. But the way it is now is the left is kind of also bureaucratically minded and stuck in the mud and unimaginative. So it's like, oh, we're going to fight climate change. How? Same old way that hasn't worked for 50 fucking years. You're going to sit in a road. Why does everything go to fucking glue your hand on a fucking door or sit in a road? You know, banner drops don't do fuck all. But then, you know, we're going to act. Do the same old shit for the thousandth time and going nowhere. And it's like, yeah, so they kind of in that spot too. And if they develop the, the imagination, they look. What they did in Hong Kong. They see in XR, they started to say, we must be like those guys in Hong Kong. They weren't in IOTA like the guys in Hong Kong. Didn't do anything. Be water? Like, nothing. They, they did a few micro protests and they did a few flash mobs and stuff, but they didn't even start down there. And now they're going to have to. I, you, um, I, I was going to just uh, what's your impression of Faulty's? Um, the first thing he's going to have to do is deal with his people who are closest to him. And, I mean, have you got any perspective on – that's going to be his first battle, I think. Yeah. Talking. I mean, if if, yeah. if, he, well, if you can sell it to him, he's got to sell it to them. And, and like, what's your impression about that? Yeah. See, while I was writing that document, then I had a lot of time to think about this. And I, the, my thinking is that he's probably – I'll share my private thoughts with you here. My thinking is that he, he knows none of this shit is working and there needs to be a radical change. Um, he often has 
express frustration that the left is all, you know, you start a climate movement and before you know it, everybody's got their, you know, pet fucking animal rebellion and social justice and the global sound just degenerates into horseshit in a matter of in seconds. So he keeps on saying, you know, we've got to shelve that stuff and just focus, which the left cannot do. So, so I think what I hope the bait that he takes is that, that an arc takes the thinking away. So you don't do any of those decision circles and, you know, um, people's um, assemblies and citizens as well. I think he's still in love with citizens assemblies, but but you know, to to try and come up with an action out of a people's assembly is you're going to get the the lowest common denominator, some bullshit out of a committee. It's it's not imaginative. I mean, the police are more imaginative than you can come out with a collective decision from the people's assembly on the left. So, I hope that he will see that it's a way where you just cut through the bullshit. Because they, those uh, those democratic things, just ditch all this liberal democratic bullshit. It's like we're in a fucking war. You cannot fight this by going, right, all you soldiers huddle up here, you know, kind of around me, take a knee, and we're going to figure out how to beat Hitler. What are the suggestions? It's like it's never going to work, dudes. You need to have a hierarchy. You need to have somebody doing the thinking. And you basically, for most brilliant battle plans, it takes a long time to figure them out. And that's their strength. Because if any battle plan relies on secrecy as an element for its success, it's doomed before it's even started. So what makes a successful battle plan is the guys don't see it or they don't believe it. So you, they're using you, you use the enemy's own prejudice and stuff uh, so that they can, you, you must be able to share your battle plan with the enemy and they wouldn't go meh and dismiss it. That's, that's its strength. And then in that meh is their defeat. So, so you, uh, you don't need to have these decision forums in that, but what you do need is something like the Battle of Trafalgar or in general, in, in these battles where people win uh, and make dramatic victories, the famous victories of personalities like, you know, Napoleon and Nelson and stuff like that. If you look at Nelson and the Battle of Trafalgar, he said they all knew what was going to happen. What happened normally was ships of the line would form up in two ranks like this, and then and then the the attacking force would come alongside and make two more lines and then they would come uh, you know and do broadsides against each other while going along in parallel like this and it would basically come down to who can load the fastest and who had the most firepower and so the on the day of trafalgar then nelson said look we're just going to change the rules every single naval exercise and battle and all the training they've done, you do the same old shit where you come alongside and blast each other to pieces. It's just, look, let's do this. <clears throat> we'll come like this, but instead of turning like they expect, you just carry on through their lines and break them in half. And then basically think, you've got two ships, each side can blast the ship, they've got no guns, you know, stern and bow, so you can splinter them and stuff, and there's like as soon as he said it, every one of his admirals went, fucking genius. <laughs> and then it's kind of stupid. It's like, why didn't somebody else do this before? And so, so that's, you know, that's what won the day. The, the French were waiting for the English to turn. <laughs> and they're waiting. And, and he never turned. When he never turned, it fucking freaked them out. And so, but you would never come out with that plan out of the committee. In fact, if you present most brilliant plans to a committee, it'll divide the room 50-50. Half the guys would say, no, it'll never work. They're, what they're really saying is, no, nah, that wasn't what I was taught, and it basically it's filled with uncertainty and I'm scared. So you, you'll never get genius out of a collective. You just got to get over that shit. And then so, so I think Fawlty realizes that. He's dropped a lot of hints. And I'm hoping the bait he takes is thinking, Hang on a minute. There are a few guys around, behind the curtain directing this. All the guys, the players, 
they don't even know what the fuck's going on. They're just having a good time running around like sheep. They're virtually automaton. So, yes. What's the... Uh, can I ask a stupid question here? I, uh, you mentioned a couple of times somewhere, I think, the wisdom of the crowd or something like that, uh, which I didn't have time to... I haven't read up on that. Uh, can you just explain briefly the difference between that and this being tied up with the, the mediocrity of... of committee decisions yeah so so it's basically self-selecting so the the intelligence of the crowd is self-selecting you see a, a, a group or an assembly like a people's assembly is is automatically um a license to be stupid a license to be stupid lazy and egotistical and people are now in the arg format if you with a gameplay like that, where people people are participating in something like a dance, um, but they are very aware that they're not getting it, that there, there's there's something going on, and some people get it, and they're following on. It's like improv or something like that. It's like so. I'll give you an example. When when I first came to London, in the, you know, in my early twenties. Then I was a, a hick, straight, you know, from South Africa, straight off the turnip truck. And so all the guys that I'd hang out with in pubs and stuff were English. I made a point to hang out with English people because I didn't want, I wanted to stay in London. And I knew if you hang out with Australians and Bobwians and South Africans, they all homesick and they all go home. So I didn't want to go, go back to South Africa. So I made a point of avoiding them and then um, hanging out with English people. Because I was new and off the turnip track, the, the English people intellectuals spent too much time in pubs. And so I was the sport. So they would talk over my head and stuff, and I didn't understand the culture, and they would kind of bait me and, you know, rattle my cage to see if they could get a rise out of me. And they had tremendous sport at my expense. But, you see, I gradually clued in to what they were doing and then basically then finally got on their wavelength, but they were being a meta layer over the conversation, you know, basically tossing me intellectually from one to the other, just having a joke at my expense. And so as soon as I realized that, then then basically I, I, I instantly got smarter because I realized, oh, okay, this is, a, this is an interesting game. And then I started, as soon as I started playing the game, then I got better at it than they were. And so it was, you know, but you see, it's it's kind of like that you realize there's a whole lot of shit in a, like the ARG format. You realize there's a whole lot of shit going over your head. You, you actually try to figure out what's going on, how, you know, and you're trying, you're struggling to try and catch up. In catching up, smarter people will get it sooner. And the dumbasses will always be lagging. They'll always be kind of, you know, tagging along. So what it means is when people get it at that collective layer and tune in, it's kind of like Timothy Leary when he says tune in, turn off and drop out. Is saying like that tuning in means they get it. They finally get it. Oh, we're not doing the wokeism and the bullshit anymore and stuff. And then we basically they start to realize there's another game afoot. And, and as it goes, you get into a dialogue with the state. So... None of this battlefield, one of the serious problems with the left is now is they think it's a static battlefield. They think that the five to ten years that we have to change the world, that's all we got left. Little window, five to ten years. They think it's always going to be, tw you know, uh, 2019. They think it's going to be pre-COVID. We're going to be privileged. It's all going to be normal. No, they're going to be fucking, the four horsemen are coming. You've got to plan an activist strategy to say, we're very likely to be at war. Go and do a banner drop when we're at fucking war. That's an insurrection. You can be shot for that, you ass. So you've got to think, like, how do we, how do we plan a grand strategy in a time of a, a cold war or a hot war? Okay, the other whole four horsemen, we already had a pandemic. The pandemic's got not gone. You can't go and like, oh, we took a year off as a sabbatical because there was a pandemic. No, 
that's your best opportunity for the last 200 years and it just flooded it. and then basically there's famine there's an economic collapse seriously i don't think anybody's going to give a rat's ass about wokeism or climate change when there's fucking economic collapse right go and have a look in the weimar republic go and have a look in argentina recently and say oh were these guys doing activism with banner drops no they were trying to fucking survive <laughs> So you got to plan all of this in, and, and but nobody's doing it. Everybody's acting like it's all about me, and I'm a privileged fucking little liberal, and basically my secure little life and my and my place in the plantation house is secure forever. And yes, we also need to address climate change. It's like it's not realistic, dudes. So 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 then the arg format then. Oh, so no, where I was going with that was was. Okay, when you start out down a, a path of rebellion, the other big blind spot that the left has is they think, you know, a rush and a push and the land is ours, <laughs> you know, like Morrissey. It's like, no. Even I think Faulty thinks that basically, you, you know, you just have this big thing and then you have a storm stage where then you take over the government. So you do Satyagraha and then basically, and then suddenly, woof, and you take, like, no, never, never, never going to be like that. It's a dance and it might be a long dance. So it's a dance with the state. So you have like one step forward, two steps back. And basically, it, it's a struggle. It's like a scrum in rugby. The reason why they teach rugby is because they're teaching you how to do bat. And, and so a scrum moves forwards and backwards, and it's a thing. And then eventually, they, they get a little break, and the ball comes out down the line and the fly half. Then they can do something creative. You know. But the, that thing, that's the idea of a battle that moves backwards and forwards and stuff is like that's what it is. So you have to think in those terms. You're not going to get what you want in a CEE bill or some big victory, and then you can go home. You, you will never really go home. You're basically, at this, the way we're going, we're all dead at the time we go home. So you've got to think in terms of a long played out dance with the state. And so the state is getting smarter too. So the state does things like censorship, and then, you know, well, at the stage we're at, we're in the stage where South Africa was doing COINTELPRO and propaganda, kind of info wars. So at that stage, they're putting out bullshit information. All the establishment and liberals and stuff, they like they don't, don't believe in conspiracy theories. You had to be in, but then eventually you get drafted into the military. You suddenly get a quick education on all the conspiracies are actually true, and then you know you. Um, uh, and then pretty soon the population gets smart and realizes, you know, we're actually in the middle of a war, even though they're not telling us. And so, they, so then um, the public starts to read the propaganda. So you can tell very quickly what the propaganda is saying because they, you know, you understand all the techniques quickly. They underreport stuff. If they say, "Hey, look at this over there," then you look at what's over there because you, you read the newspaper and you think, "Why are they suddenly telling you all this thing and going?" making a big deal out of it. And you say, it must be distracting you from whatever's go to page three. Ah, there it is. <laughs> like, you know, insurgents coming over the border and the things like, ah, got it. So the, the, the public smartens up and they start to learn how to read the government's bullshit. Then, then the, it goes into a new level where the government knows that you double guess in them. So then they start a bluff on the bluff. So then basically, you know, they put a thing, they really tell you the real horror in the news. And then everybody goes, well, can't really be that bad because the, the government would never tell us. And it's like, ha ha. <laughs> but it is that bad. They, they want you to think that. So you get into this, this game and it goes along. So the same happens with tactics on the, with the rebellion. As the rebellion gets more and more radical, then the government too starts to respond and they start to feel each other out and the dance goes back and forth. So I expect that this is going to be a long old dance because what I think my guess is they're going to use geoengineering to stave off climate change at the expense of the planet. Every day they do geoengineering is digging a bigger hole for us to die in. 
and but but w they can with geoengineering they can bring it down to you know the climate by one degree they can ramp up oil and stuff and start to try and address the economy that way um you know everything will be going to shit the, the ocean will be acidifying you're getting more and more ghastly headlines and it's getting more and more dystopian as they do it but they will be able to carry it on and drag out our agony for a long time so you must must assume that the five, in the five to ten years, we might switch into a path which you know, there's 50 years, 100 years of hell, a dystopia with geoengineering and stuff like that. Are you you're mute? Could I go back to the question that Gary um, asked you about the difference between the, the shit of committee decision and the, and the wisdom of the crowd? Because something came to my mind there about about um, grasping what you call the egregore that's out there, without without trying without without being in the realm of control, without being in the in the realm of decision, you know. And I I think that where we were earlier about talking about faulty and and his tactics to to sell this to his to to the people that are around him, I think that if we can manage to get him on that level. And with people around him who are who can grasp that too, I think we should we might want to address some of his entourage too, because and yeah, it's certainly yeah. something happening there that that is not that is uh, that is very good. Uh, and I'm not going to talk about his movement, but you know, it's just uh, I, I think it's not enough maybe to just to just reach out to him. I uh, know really if uh, one step at a time. So yeah. I think basically if you see he's the key. So so it's kind of like uh it's he's the veto, right? So if 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 he vetoes it you can't go anywhere no matter how many other people yeah. you convince. So so you just got to concentrate on who has a veto decision and it's him. So so it doesn't help to get more allies in fact you're wasting resources by you know, but can you, can you grasp? Can you grasp the absurdity of this kind of uh, thing that we've all been? Probably everybody here has been in committees' decisions where you have this board yeah. and people write things, and then you start uh, in, and and this this kind of thinking that is that is unproductive and leads to, as you said, a, a sort oh, of. Oh, he's, he's well aware of it. I, th I think it's yeah. the bang of his life. But okay. uh, you see, I think it's generally people understand it. It's just they have no alternative, so so they won't break away from it. So they won't break the habit until they have a better alternative. And without any, then they're just stuck in this rut. So hopefully this is the better term. So, yeah, maybe you misunderstood where I was going with the propaganda. Now, I wasn't going off the topic of, of the uh, collective mind. What I'm saying is the collective mind evolves to, like, you start to understand propaganda, you start to understand... The, the government's moves and stuff. Now, some people understand that better than others. But, but you see, everybody's at some, so, some layer. You see, some part of the population in South Africa, they were thinking, you know, this country is going to be white for in the next thousand years. You know, it's like bang the table. And then other people would be like, yeah, we, we've got about 10 years and we're probably going to have a Rwanda-style genocide. And then, you know, the... So there are the various people that get the truth. So it's very like climate change. Some people think it's all, you know, solar panels and wind farms and, you know, and then they, they go through those stages of, um, you know, grief, really, where they realize, okay, that's not going to work. And they're abandoned and they say, well, maybe this and maybe that. And eventually they get to be doomers and say, you know, we really are fucked. But, you see, the guys that are, you know, really get it, so, so the collective mind, the intelligence of the collective mind, you see it's going through a big gradient filter. And the guys at the top of the filter get it. Those are the guys that are ultimate philosophers because then they're saying, like, you know, this is the battle of Thermopylae. We are the 300 and we're doomed. We're just doing, you know, virtue ethics or right action. We, we you know, you just say we're doomed. You just go down doing the right thing, which is to fight. And so those are the guys that get it the most. And then that becomes, you see, now think of all the other 
think of the opposition, the, op uh, the opposition and the government. The government is thinking, no, we're going to manage this. We're going to use soil engineering and we're going to put this hand up this ass and we're going to tap dance here. We're going to stand on this, you know, higher wire and we're going to basically be chew chewing gum um, and basically we'll fix the, cli you know, climate crisis at the same time. Like, no, you're going to fuck it up royally like everything you fucking touch. But they don't get that. So they, they, they also have a collective mind that is an opposition, but it's a Vogon mind, it's a mechanical mind, it's it's rationalist, it's very step procedural, um, un, unimaginative. So, you know, we have to use all our creativity to defeat that, and probably the only reward is a, a nice hospice, but <laughs> it's worth, worthwhile doing. What else do you do? So, so everybody gets it in, in a rank. So, the same applies to this art. If you look at the document, it's pitched, it's pitched, kind of less than faulty. Faulty is, is real doomer, but it's it's pitched one step below doom. It's kind of pitched. I I, I did pitch it, thinking he would actually shop it around to other people, and then I thought that you know they're very likely to not have such an holistic viewpoint. So so then. It's kind of, you know, left the door open to say, yeah, we can fix the climate crisis. <laughs> Meanwhile, I don't think I or Faulty think that we're ever going to fix the climate crisis. Have we had that conversation with Faulty really the last time? Not really, because we, you sort were doing of. sort of. Yeah, but yeah. I, I, I don't yeah. know that he does he snuff opium or not at all. Not to no, he he said many times that like we're heading the scenario we're heading for is okay. like worse than yeah. bad. Yeah. yeah, that's as close as he comes. Did you want to say something, Tom? I thought you. Are you wait? You you muted. Still muted. You need to. To the, at the bottom, at the bottom of the screen, you might have a little thing with the microphone, camera and microphone. Still can't hear you. You must have it on your phone. Yeah, you. For, for, for some reason, yeah, he's for some reason he is muting and unmuting there on the phone. I'm not really sure. Oh well. Anyway, it's, so, not, it's so, not a. I just um, but, 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 hear everybody's I, I dropping feel, in and out, you know. Yeah, I, I feel quite good about that side of things because, you know, um, we have a lot in common. Like, the, you know, we have the same thing about virtue ethic. And, you know, you don't think in terms of utilitarian. Um, so... Yeah, we we think along the same lines of you know in terms of doomerism. Oh, hi Tom. Hi, is that working? Ah, yes. Yeah, it's working now. It's working. Happened. Weird. I was pressing the on off. As oh, sorry. Um, yeah, just quickly. Yeah, I haven't had a chance to read um your document you've done, but yeah, I definitely think the route in. Um, just thinking in terms of um, but. That team human, that is really, that is a winner. I, I just, I love that. And I was just thinking in terms of coming in not so much from the climate crisis with, in respect of the ARG, but when you think, like when you were saying about how, you know, the state says one thing and, and you know, you can tell they're lying and they're censoring everything now. It's like with that protest yesterday in London, you know, it was the biggest ever, the anti-lockdown protest. And again, obviously, they're just lying about the numbers on every single one. But the cool thing is, I think, I don't think it's, I don't think um, Roger t always talks about targeting the young people. But I actually think that there's quite a lot of, normies now who are like looking at all of this great reset stuff like normal like you know quite clever articulate people journalists people in finance all sorts of people are going on those marches now and they're going hang on a minute this is looking dark like they're getting it um from that respect you know in terms of uh that there's obviously an agenda and they're using this crisis to further lots of rather yeah Mac, um, well, not 
Gully, but you know, very dark agendas. Um, and I, so I think that there's a route in there with the ARG to, to appeal to, yeah, all those people. Um, I don't know. But. Yeah, I think so. Definitely a skeptic a skepticism of the system. But mm, yeah, it's the, pretty, the game changer is, is a geoengineer. Because I think uh, geoengineering is it, because geoengineering really does separate the sheep from the goats. Because yeah. you can be, you know, techno-optimist and, you know, think the industrial revolution is cool and, you know, civilization has, has its problems, but, you know, it's, we can make it green and sustainable and do regenerative society. Well, well, that bullshit goes out the window when geoengineering is on the table. Geoengineering really says, are we transhumanists that are going to take control of this entire planet down to the weather? Hmm. And do you think we're up to it? Or are you smart enough to realize that is utter hubris? But if it's utter hubris, we have to stop the project. We have to stop the civilization project. So it's a real fork in the road. And I think basically we should drive it home for all it's worth. Yeah, I mean, that. but, but how... Uh... I mean, I, yeah, I get the, the geoengineering, but I kind of still, um, I don't know, maybe it's just because I've got my head in all the COVID and lockdown bollocks and that all the, everyone is like all optimistic at the minute and thinks that everything's sold. And I kind of think the, yeah, the geoengineering thing is coming. Like, obviously, it's coming pretty quick, but I kind of feel like to get to everyone to understand that side of it first, you need to break them down um you know well hopefully it will be done for us because of the financial crisis and maybe because of how the pandemic will pan out this winter or autumn when they finally lose hope that oh shit that first vaccine no that's not the end of it you know that's that's actually and then you can you know attack with all the other problems i i, I don't know but yes, I, think, I think that's right i think that's right we must we must think in terms of um, a second wave in autumn. So, so already it's 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 looking a certainty because uh, Israel is the most one of the most vaccinated countries in the world, and they they their numbers are starting to pick up with the Delta variant. So it's like so it's pretty obvious that the vaccines don't work. There's so, more and more indicators, more and more indicators everywhere, everywhere. Yeah, it's just so, it, so it, kind it's of a Israel, was one of the, Israel was one of the 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 ideal situation where they had that enormous percentage of the population vaccinated and it's 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 just uh, you know and, and they were yeah, the earliest australia is going down and yeah, it's locked yeah. down new south wales yeah. melbourne and stuff and it's yeah. uh, it's they were all laughing like my sister in in perth and that said like nah pandemics other people's problem didn't even come here it's like and eh, yeah. not so much now I mean, yeah. I mean, here in UK, yeah, I've noticed it here. It's, it's. Sorry, go ahead, go. Ahead. I was just going to say, while well, well, we're on topic, sorry, Tom, uh, is that yeah, like really looking at the uh, virus in Australia, it's just a problem of Melbourne and Sydney, basically. Everybody else, and uh, well, they did have it in Brisbane, but just the uh, the largest um, metropolitan areas, and it's just not an issue anywhere else. Yeah, I think that's going to change, though. That, that Delta variant is kind of spooky. Yeah, they talked well, about yeah. mutant strain the other day, like another variation from the Indian variant or something. Yeah, Delta, Delta Plus. Delta Delta. Delta. They don't even want to go to Echo. They just like... <laughs> it, it, it might be time to bring back Kevin uh, for a conversation next week if we have some questions on the... On those uh, on those uh, new viruses and you know those variants and, and and the evolution of things, I know he's very focused at the moment on his uh, on his anti vaccine and things like that and all sorts of other topics that I I, I still sometimes look at on his server just to keep in touch. But um, I, maybe it could be a, an opportunity because we we it's always at the background like this this pandemic. Yeah. Too. Have another, do you agree with that uh, as a group? Yeah, I look at this stuff occasionally. It's just a, a little bit off in the weeds there, you know, like for, for the, the no, stuff we're doing. Is about, if you have some questions, yeah. he's a good guy to, to answer Can those. I, uh, I want to know about the prions and stuff. And, uh, news I know. On that side. 
Yeah, I know, I know. It's that that yeah. prion thing is his his line of work. You see, that's his research. Yeah, and that's what he that's what he likes to talk yeah, about. Yeah, I'm wondering, um, has anybody else? Has anybody else listened to any of those talks by Gert Banden, Banden Bosch? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I'm yeah. just wondering whether what, – what, what's the feeling about him uh, talking to him? Because he, he was talking about the, the development of new variants um, to a greater degree than anyone, any of the others have. So I don't know what the thoughts are there. Well, that would be somebody to reach out to. That's a very good idea. Uh, it's just that he's very alone in his um, in his fear. He's been completely isolated, and I don't know if we're not just going to end up with just hearing him with his theory. And I, I uh, you know, he's a he's a vet who has done a lot of research in in fictions, and he, I, I think I, even though you, there's probably. Sorry, uh, it's you know, very dense. He's he's really, I mean, incredibly um, learned guy. But yeah, it's heavy. I listened to, I think it was Chris Martinson on Peak Prosperity. He did an interview with him, but I think he just basically broke the interview down and then did his own presentation of his theory because it is quite, the guy is not native English speaker and it's just, very dense in terms of understanding the all of the elements of it but he is really 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 interesting guy there's a lot to take in there. Um, um, yeah talking phd level virology it's quite complex to he, understand to contribute he did more do one, um, <laughs> to contribute more to this going he on, did do one, one video Going on into the weeds of the COVID uh, um. <laughs> uh, confusion, um, there's another uh, British um, scientist, Dr. Michael Eden, and his theory is that the variants are not going to be very, very different from whatever actually the original co uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus is. So he's kind of thinking that as long as uh, that it's not going to be totally uh, different. But of course, that's the current thing. We don't know how it will evolve in the future. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that it can form a chimera. So it, mm. it can meet some horrid virus and form a, a, a chimera that might be very, very bad indeed. I've in, also in fact, gone into the started. rabbit. The um, rabbit if I can just mention that. Please go ahead. Uh, I was just going to add about uh, Vandenbosch from what Tom said. He has done, uh, I think, he, one of his most recent video uh, that I saw just a couple of weeks ago where he did actually present it in plain English. Uh, and it, 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 he sort of got, a, I think he might have realized the problem that you were describing. It was extremely dense and you had to really focus yes. on it. Yeah, best interview um, with um, uh, um, Brett Weinstein because Brett was saying, "Okay, let's yeah. just play it out in layman's terms and just to you know yeah. make it very yeah, simple." No, he, he did a uh, he did another one by himself. But it wasn't an interview. He just came on by himself and he just spoke, and it was mm. actually very good. It was just really laid out very clearly and simply, uh, and it, it, you know the kind of thing that 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 you could follow without sort of um, Will you know, you getting it your brain stressed down? out too much. So. Would you? Would yeah, I'll you try and find it for you. Yeah, yeah. Because then, right. you know, yeah, it, really, a it. lot of yeah. people who talk, there's so many people between him, between that guy that you mentioned, uh, mm -hmm. that English guy, Michael Hayden, and, um, of course, all sorts of others. So yeah, yeah. With, with interviewing one guy is going to be... Um, you know, they're all very entrenched in their positions and their research. It's like when you talk to Kevin, too. Like, so the best thing is to maybe find a panel of people who could talk and the, debate. Maybe. <laughs> no, but, you no, know, the, if you want to do a on the movie, we could work on a serious panel of people who might be tearing at each other, but at least we might get something out of the out of the thing because I, the, I, I feel like in yeah. the other one that was yeah, interesting was the English. Uh, three seconds, right? 
take no, down uh, from the three seconds in. <laughs> Sukarak Bay. Bakti as well, German guy. Yeah, Bakti, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's yes, he's guy. another one. There are so but, many of them. Yeah, you kind of got Sukarak Bakti who's saying why is it needed, COVID isn't as bad as it was um, billed. Then you've got um, Gert van den Bosch, who's, you know, he is a vaccinologist, he believes in vaccines, but he is arguing that in this instance, vaccination is very, very bad because you're doing it during a pandemic, so you'll get immune escape. Then Mike Yeadon was the former Pfizer um, CEO, and he's kind of gone down the conspiracy theorist thinking it is basically a depopulation program because um, he can't see, again, he doesn't believe that COVID was ever as bad as they've said, and that he just can't add it up in his head. He's like, well, it's it must be some really nefarious project. So basically, yeah. Yes, so no, I, a, I, I agree. It's of those three scientists there, but they're all yeah experts in their own field. But, I agree with what you said, I agree absolutely. He's very... But don't forget all these guys, all the data they have. When they talk about... They, they talk about a vaccine or therapy that is totally new, it, that doesn't work as the other vaccines. So all the data we have from the past, like vaccinating during pandemics, uh, all these sort of things, this is based on traditional vaccines. It's not based on this therapy that is not sterilizing the virus and that is only really there to prevent people from ending up in ICU or having serious disease, really because it doesn't stop you from getting COVID and it doesn't stop you from transmitting it as opposed to all the other vaccines that we've heard before. Even the old flu vaccine that you used to do, was given every year to people, normally people will not get and will not transmit it with that, that one. But so we're in, the, we're in total limbo and you, you have a lot of people emerging like that, of researchers. It reminds me of what Hugh said last year, when he was uh, telling us about reading uh, the Journal of the Plague of Daniel Defoe, you know, during these terrible, apocalyptic, uh, frightening eras, all sorts of people emerge with their message and their, their kind of, but we're in the unknown. And, and even in our days of science, etc., these guys are great. I mean, I'm learning a lot from them and I'm not diminishing, but you have to be, and I'm, who am I, a little, tiny, little, a uh, little doctor uh, isolated in the countryside to, to, to stand up to these guys. But with a bit of common sense, we have to realize that we're, we're in a territory that we're going to hear a lot of things and we, we might be wasting our time, um, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, uh, listening too much to this one and that one. That's why Kevin is yeah. a bit of a... Uh, Kevin is a bit of an, a, an outsider in the way that he is... First, he's a, he's a guy on the terrain. He doesn't talk... Um, hmm. He can. He, he's got a lot of data, and he listens to all these guys. That's why I was thinking. I was suggesting him again. First, he's fun to engage with, and second, because he, he he's collected an awful lot of stuff, you know. But these are the guys I have. Don't get me wrong. I have all but admiration for the courage that they have to stand up. But I, I was thinking what, the same what? thing. Actually, I, I thought. Yeah, I I was thinking the same thing because, from our point of view. The real value out of I mean, you can't do anything about the pandemic. So the part, the real value of it is that, it, as far as I can see, is that it undermines people's belief in the state. Yeah. Because, you see, before this, they had irrational expectations about, you know, the power of governments and the power of doctors and the power of the United Nations and stuff. And all of that has fallen away. So mm. all these guys come out of the woodwork and everybody's an expert and the government's floundering and, you know, turns out all the, you know, America's favorite uncle Fauci and everything turns out to be deep in this conspiracy of like bioweapons research. And so mm. the, the, the gold in all of this is, is very hard to maintain a liberal belief in. So, so and trust in the government. So that's a, that's our biggest the biggest value of this for us is we've got a window before everybody forgets and starts trusting the government again is that now people don't believe shit <laughs> they don't believe anything and so these guys are only good for reinforcing you know the fact that nobody knows what the hell's going on but I, I think a safe bet is that it'll get worse so mm -hmm. 
Yeah, the government will look more incompetent. And, and I think what's happening now is they, they're screwing up big time. Because mm -hmm. in the exuberance to get everybody back into a functional economy, they fucked up big time. And that's raised everybody's expectations again. So that mm -hmm. when they dashed, people are going to be really, really broken. And I'd say that that's our, our key. So, so if that happens, we should be prepping for it. We say, like, what do we do? Uh, when everybody's massively disappointed and angry with the government. And then what the, you know, imagine that they have, you know, anti-lockdown protests where, and, the, you know, the, say, let's take the, the UK. The, and the police and crimes bill has already gone through. The, the police are going to mop up. <laughs> it's going to turn bloody because mm. basically the, the mm. rubber really meets the road there because you can't do a, an old style, you know, protest anymore. So the public, we're talking about, you know, this dance. Well, you know, what Pretty Patel has done is a is a severe overreach in the tango. <laughs> and and so what's going to happen is people people are going to have a radical response. You know, you you when you start putting people under pressure, that that kettle is going to be under serious pressure when when the police starts flexing their muscles with with that bill. And people are really angry because they were betrayed. So you can imagine things like the poll tax riots and, you know, against Maggie and stuff. It might look kind of like that in Trafalgar Square because the police will be trying to enforce their newfound powers and doing outrageous things. And the protest well, will be angry as all fuck. So I think we should think ahead to that day. Yeah, because all the, the small businesses and everything, all these people, people are really pissed off, like, you know, because they didn't get the 21st of June was supposed to be Freedom Day. And of course, it was, you know, again, Johnson, Witty, Valance, they came on TV and they looked ashen faced. And you could tell they knew they were lying. Like, and, and people were just like, this is fucking ridiculous, you know, people in... in uh, small who are small business because none of the because a lot of people are like, oh well look it's just another four weeks but they're like look we're still having to do you know uh, distancing and you can't have large events and you can't have weddings you can't there's so many things you still can't do if particularly if you're you know if you've spent 15 months you know festivals they're out of the window pretty much and people love all that stuff and they're just like absolutely at their wits end so if if it comes to July 19th and again, they say, oh, look, Indian variant, you know, we're going to have to like, you know, carry on with this. People are just going to be a breaking point and they're probably just not going to stand for it. So hopefully that's the time when they start yeah, losing faith. Because the problem is that most of the people during this whole thing have run to the state and they've gone, oh, you know, this is this is what we need to do, you know. Everybody's been a bit of a zombie, well, but I think there's a growing crowd of people that are just yeah. like waking up and being like, there's something not right here, it stinks. Um, I think it's a moment of opportunity. I, th I think yeah. we should plan plan for, for it, expecting. Because if it doesn't happen, there'll, there'll be something, you know. Look, I mean, you can see what's going on, or at least I think I can. And, and then can, I, uh, can I? Yeah. Go ahead. Can I say something? Uh, um, yeah. yeah, I was just thinking uh, uh, about looking, viewing the virus, because you the pandemic as an opportunity situation, but I was thinking uh, in terms of the, the kind of uh, args that you're talking about, that in a way the, the virus has arisen and, you know, you, you may or may not want to subscribe to whether it was deliberately done, but it's being in a co-opted by governments to further authoritarian agendas. But the thing is, you can just game jack the virus game, more or less, um, you know, in, in terms of, of what you were just saying, where people are going to get fed up and then it's going to be up to them. That, that, that gives them the opening to, to seize the particular game um, which is currently being used for the control agenda and turn it back to their own. So you could sort of look at the, the whole virus situation as being a, a, a game that it, that could be subject to game jacking and, and look at it from that point of view. Uh, yes, so, but I think I I, 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 my, my gut feel is that it was an accident. So, mm. so it's kind of an inconvenience on the bigger game. 
And you, the the bigger game is the one that can be game jacked. So the bigger game is the great reset. And there's there's definitely a financial great reset. And the, and I'm increasingly believing that there's a military component to it. So the you know the, the way they're moving the chess pieces now is they're getting you can see they're moving closer and closer. We we we're thoroughly in the Cold War too. But mm. I I mean I think they're lining the crosshairs on Iran and stuff. The all the chips and stuff they're trying to get clean chipsets and stuff like that. You can see them moving towards um, a big war to contain China, um, and that that would be you know in about 2024. So I think they're trying to clear the decks for the next operation. Is is what what they seem to be doing. Um, yeah, and that is that is not. Um, that is not clear um, if the majority of people. And Tom, you say that you're having big protests, anti-lockdown protests in the UK. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't really, uh, I don't get it. It's except that well, people don't want to be controlled by the state and the state telling them to to be in lockdown. But deep down, people know that there's a vi variant. They know that there's danger. They know all these things. And uh, are they not campaigning for self-imposed uh, measures without, with, what are they asking? Are they asking for the government to lift the lockdown or are they asking to, 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 to be in power and to decide themselves in their communities, in their areas, what to do? What, what is the root of the anti-lockdown? I don't get it. I think there's a mixture of people there. So you, you have got, of course, like all these protests, you've got the tin hat foil people, you've got the people that will always go to protest, but there is a, a growing majority of middle class um, business owners that are, that are saying enough, like this has gone on too long now. We have the vaccination program, which of course, the, most of these people are following the letter of the mainstream media. And they're saying we we have got probably the second best vaccination program in the world where we've you know other countries in europe have opened up more states in america have opened up more why are we still being and they are starting to look they're starting to go down the rabbit hole in respect of you know some of them are um, in respect of great reset agenda and all of these you know the world economic forum so yeah it's a mix it's it's you know it's a mess but yeah i i agree i you know i'm i'm not saying that i, I um that i, I sub, sub, somewhere in the middle and it, you know there, there's definitely a virus and i agree with you it's particularly an accident but i think i kind of feel like yeah the vaccination thing is yeah that's clearly going to end up being a disaster because we've gone and interfered haven't we and it's a new therapy and it's probably going to cause what van der bosch has said but we don't know i mean who knows but but I, I think, yeah, we should, uh, that those people would be right for turning, you know, initially just turning their heads to being, yeah, against the state and say, look, because clearly that agenda of the World Economic Forum and the Great Reset, they want to destroy small business. They don't want small business anymore, do they? Um, that is clearly a, I don't think that's a conspiracy. That's just. Yeah, but, but that's a liberal, that's a liberal agenda. Those anti-lockdown people are total liberals. They're, they're just having a... a, a, a yeah, so you're right. They do. They are uh, clearly they want life to go back to normal. But my point is, I think that's a way in yeah, to, to, to get those people on board and say, look, this is what is really going on. And oh, also this. <laughs> it's also the beginning of a lot of other worse things. So I, that was just my point. Um, well, I know. But I live in a country where people believe totally, the majority of people believe totally in the vaccine, believe totally in what the government is selling and that we you know economy economy everywhere and i i know exactly it's, it's very similar to what's going on in the uk here too but i'm trying to see how we can uh hijack these anti-lockdown sentiments because they could be a great um uh asset a great strategy for our side of thinking how, how the, do we yeah well that's, that's what i'm thinking too yeah. yes, but i think the best gift we could have is if everybody went into lockdown again because yep. in, in lockdown, then they online and we can start yep. testing some of these tactics. I think you're right, yeah. And I mean, there's so many more independent journalists who are like looking at this through that kind of lens. And I think that in some ways they're opening their eyes. A lot of people are being woken up to, yeah, just the 
sort of nefarious nature of the state and, so, and so we need to do lockdown it's conspiracy theorists are actually they seem to be the most sane people now <laughs> it's funny it's just yeah. bizarre the world we're living in but so doomers yeah. are having a field day because finally everybody realizes that things have, can go wrong so we need, to, we need to call for lockdown we need to, we need to support any any type of 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 people who are calling for lockdown we need to yeah, to, oh, to, yeah, yeah, no, no, but we can't be seen to call for lockdown. You got, you got to step in <laughs> no, the anti-lockdown center. They can but, impose a lockdown. Well, how do you call, how do you call for lockdown? You you propagate the numbers, the risks, the 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 the, the failure of the vaccine. You know. The, yeah, and if it's not for the for COVID, it will be possibly because we're going to go into like massive financial crisis, and they're going to use lockdowns yeah. to put everyone homes because all the cash points are going to go kaput, and they're going to need time. Yeah. It'll take probably weeks for yeah. them to pull this shit out when they finally pull the plug on <laughs> all of that side of it. Um, I mean, yeah. again. You know, what's all this UFO business about? I don't know what's going on there. That's uh, another yeah, you, the, I, My understanding of the UFO is it's just a faction of nutcases in the Pentagon. So is it? I don't, uh, yeah. I, basically, I think I've always heard that there's there's a bunch of guys who are influential enough to get Star Wars going, right? Or Space Force. And um, there's a large group uh, of people in the Pentagon that thinks we're about to have an alien invasion. Personally, I think they're not cases, but the, the, there's certainly sh weird shit going out there. But, but oh. yeah, it's, 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 I don't think it's really... No, I mean, I, it's, it's a, I, that's what I kind of thought you would... Yeah, that's what I was thinking. It's, but, but it's another well, element of fear to make people think, oh, what, what's going on? Like, they're not... Well, it, it's, I, I think that they're trying to bring it out into the public because now that they have basically Space Force, they need to fund it. So they need they need their threat. So they, they'll so push it. Little but things so, wait, on this, on the, but on this topic, the, the, I think the, the obvious things coming down the pike are uh, the cyber war. I, I really believe in this, you know, Agenda 201 and stuff, and they're practicing for a big, you know... Side of uh, that's coming yeah, out so, so yeah. basically, I'm, I'm a big believer in that Herald's exactly the same deal. Um, and so I don't think they're doing that for nothing. Um, and so, and then, uh, yeah, in a couple of days, the end of June is quite quite a big point um, for Basel III. We're going to see what happens with the banker's internal war. Um, and the, the winner of that fight uh, will determine a lot about what happens with gold and silver. But I think by these next six months are the prelude to a financial collapse. Um, and we're talking bail-ins and, and disasters like that. So it's, um, I think there are a lot of spooks in the cupboard, uh, in the financial cupboard. And I think they, all the zombies are going to start coming out of the banking system yeah so they had I, the other thing they had the other day uh, on the uk government website we're testing emergency siren that can just go off on your android phone like randomly they're doing it in america and they were testing it in one area of england and just just a, a, an emergency siren on your phone that just go off randomly no it's, a, it's in america it's been a, there since the cold war but they they uh, that kind of thing is you know it's kind of like a preparation for war the, those those kind of things when they start doing shit like that you know we're going to war but i i think we should ignore the the covid because it's it's kind of obvious and i don't think we can contribute so it doesn't it doesn't make a lot of sense to talk to these guys because you're just getting involved in a kind of fud um and the fog of war but uh, if we, I think we should be forward looking and look at the cyber thing and look at the financial thing because yeah. that, everybody's going to be blindsided by that and it would be good to be ahead of the game and we, mm. we should find our next um, Kevin in the financial industry and then basically cyber security because mm. there must agree, be guys. I agree, I agree totally. Yeah. I think I, I thought because we were talking about COVID there that 
best person to ask question. But honestly, I think if we have to spend time online and have conversations, it's advancing and things and, and help us to, even towards the ARG and its aim, I think we need to leave that aside and concentrate on what you say. I totally agree. Yeah, so let's, let's look into that. Maybe we should start seeing um, more about that, the cyber, uh, what, what that exercise like? Cyber polygon. Like, yeah. yeah, polygon, that was it, yeah. That, yeah. And, and, and maybe talk to people around, yeah, there, there are lots of like shaking in the, you, know, you can see the threads and the web are trembling in various places. And uh, yeah, yeah, that'd be nice. It's balance. more, um, you know, like we uh, we uh, talked about and watched and read the Bright Green Lies book and movie. It's almost like it would be good to, uh, <laughs> to coin a phrase that's like lies upon lies, you know, like all these lies are um, getting um, exposed. <laughs> yeah, but there's so many damn lies. It's just a house <laughs> so of many, lies. Yes. So many, so many lies. House of lies. lies. A, good, a good title, House of Lies. <laughs> yeah. I remi it reminds me of insects and ticks, though. <laughs> Maybe we could speak to someone like um, Snowden, see what he thinks about it. Jesus, I don't know. I, I, no, I think it's a little hard to get to get yeah. an interview with him, he's famous, but... I don't know, I'm trying to think are, of someone in that vein, like some, Well, uh, Mike, Ma Mike uh, Maloney, I would always like to have talked to him. He's in, you yeah. know, gold bike. Yeah. Um, Alistair, Alistair McLeod, I think it is, who's that? Oh, yeah, 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 he's an interesting guy, yeah. That yeah, Chris he's... Martinson blog, uh, there's a spin-off of it um, called Wealthion, and they've always interviewed um, uh, luminaries or experts in the finance world. So I think those oh. two people you just mentioned, Lord Hugh, have been interviewed by Adam Taggart. So, um, and are, they're always talking about inflation or the Great Reset and all this financial um, events. But those guys are kind of like old school, sort of gold buggy, like Austrian economist types. I, I'm just wondering about um, someone who's a bit more, yeah, avant-garde a bit more. The, the problem like, is the avant-garde guys are crypto guys. And, and then they, they're, they're that Tyler Durden. <laughs> yeah, Hedge. but well, the guys at, at Zero Hedge, they they are, I mean, they're kind of right-wing libertarians. You can't, yeah. you can't post anything from Zero Hedge <laughs> on Reddit. It just gets instantly removed. But the guys on and I agree with the guys on Zero Edge. They do know what's what's coming. I mean, there's there's you know the inflation is rampant. They pumped so much money into the economy. It's just an extraordinary pool of money. And so yeah, you're starting to see it. You know, filter into prices and stuff. Um, yeah, I think I think inflation in the states is running at about twelve percent. So that. Yeah. That's the, gonna that's gonna cause tears. Tears are going up, aren't they? And a lot of people been pointing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the Fed says the Powell and the Fed is saying, you know, like, well, nobody's got a job. How can prices go up? <laughs> is they like, what are you talking about? The price of the stock market, the price of houses, there's is like everything is going through. Just the fact they don't measure them doesn't mean anything. Yeah. Monaco 64 was saying we we're, he reckons we were in the crack up boom where it's just starting, you know, like where you had the crack up boom, don't you, before the hyperinflationary event? Well, um, well, they measure GDP as the money circulating after they inflate the money supply. So it's like, of course, there's a, a recovery when you pump money in because they, they you know, it's, uh, it's, the money slushing around, but it's nobody's. There's no demand. There's no extra demand. Nobody has an extra job to afford all of this shit. It's just mm -hmm. slushing around in all these, you know, asset bubbles and stuff. So, so, yeah. They. It's only a matter of time before there's a very, very loud bang that's going to be heard around the world. But they, oh, they, they, they intend it. They, they want it. They, 
they they need to restructure. They need another Bretton Woods. But in the in the time between inflating the economy and everybody's going like, yay, economy is getting back post COVID, which it isn't. It's just being inflated with QE. It, from there to you know Venezuela and hyperinflation and people you know having parallel currencies and community currencies and stuff just to survive then you know in that window before then they start cashless society there's a mm. lot of discontent yeah. so the governments can easily move power the, the the see they're really playing with fire because what the only gambit a government really has is safety in the status quo so if the government itself says it's time for a big revolution that puts the idea of revolution in play and then it becomes whose revolution what revolution <laughs> and they quickly lose lose the control of that narrative so this is a big time for us i think we should try and position uh, expecting that to happen so so yeah, yeah. The, who, who was that guy in the film um uh, the the film about the financial crisis the guy i think it was um the big short was, like, film? big Michael short Murray? Yeah. The, yeah that character yeah he's trying to get him <laughs> i don't know where he is yeah, well, that'd be good. well you know it might be worth looking at people who've lived through hyperinflation mm -hmm. so people in venezuela and stuff economists I would love to talk to an economist from Venezuela. Mm -hmm. um, There's a YouTube who actually he was um, he's got a channel and he was talking about this. I'll try and dig it out. Um, and he was coming from a personal experience in um, an Eastern European country after the fall of um, the Soviet Union. Um, I can't remember this. It's quite a new one that came up on my feed. And he was saying, just doing a, a YouTube tutorial on this is what happens, you know, when it all goes to shit. It was quite good, actually. Um, is that, yeah, that the Dimitri Orlov? Uh, is that Dimitri Orlov? Yeah, he's, he's just a, a story guy. Guy. He's a Russian guy who lives in the States now, but he, he based all his books on, on going through the collapse of the Soviet Union. And he's, he's written a lot about economics, but also sorts of things. He lives on a boat. On the east coast, and he's. We tried once, didn't we? Did mm. we? Did we try him? I don't know if we did. I don't remember. I, I would love to talk to him. He he yeah. would be a great guy to to yeah, contact. I think Dmitry Olov. We should try to get all of him. That would be really good as well because yeah. he's got a really good riff on all of what happened with the French Assignon, um, you know, during well, I the. Right, yeah. I, I can't see it now, now and again, and uh, I, yeah. I look at the plans of his boat to live on. It was like funny the way, he, but yeah, we, we could try to, yeah. Um, well, or, or, or somebody that knows an historian that knows about the Asignor would be really cool. Well, he, he's quite a good. That was pretty, um, pretty. I think it was Olaf. Uh, did, did. <clears throat> yeah, Dmitry Olaf. Olaf, who wrote uh, the five stages of collapse, uh, that's the book I read. But he's written a lot of other ones. Um, yeah, I don't know what he's doing now. At the moment, he's quite silent. He's got a blog. I could, I could fish. I could have a look. I have a look, and I'll. Yeah, in, in the good forest is perennial. Mm. And why is the idea of Snowdown completely outrageous? Why not? You never know. Yeah, exactly. I, I, I don't think he would answer. I mean, I, I mean, I assume he gets thousands of... But the worst that could happen is if he, he says no, but, you know, we, we, we are... We're talking yeah, about I mean, if, if you want to, but, but I, I mean, I just assume oh, yeah. guys that are that famous, you you can't get hold of them. They, they will give you a standard form letter to. But they, they they'd ask you who you are and stuff, and I think you you know he only talks to big news organizations and stuff. I don't think he deals with small fry. But yeah, I mean, geez, I'd love to talk to someone, but there are others. There's. Uh, Edward Binney and stuff is also in that realm, um, but Binney, Binney's Binney's a 
he does actually believe in the state. <laughs> so it's kind of Edward Snowden that believes in the state, if you can believe that. Um, but and but the, there are lots of lots of guys. Um, yeah, anybody ex NSA or something like that would be really really good. And the other thing is is to talk to people on the inside. There are a lot of guys from the DHS and stuff like that that, that I've known over years. I don't know if they'll talk publicly, but they, they might talk anonymously. And I, I would love people to know, especially liberals, to know what's coming. They, is, is they don't know what's in the... If you tell them what's in those disaster plans and all the things that, that the DHS has, they, they'll raise you the hair on the back of your neck. They, they are really grisly shit. And liberals don't believe it. And so it's, you know, I thought that, that XR, one of the things that XR should do, uh, said ages ago, they should go to, you know, the county level and demand to see the disaster plans and on the basis that, you know, a lot of them have been declassified and they really, you, you don't want to be, you don't want to live under those disaster plans. I mean, stuff in the UK is like uh, they will send someone from the House of Lords. So you'll get some senile guy over the House of Lords in an emergency, and they will send him to your county, and he will he will have absolute authority. He could pull out a pistol and shoot somebody. And yeah, there's a really good documentary. It's still on YouTube from BBC Newsnight, and it's called When the Bomb Falls or something. Right. It's about if yeah. there was Armageddon, like what happens in these local um, bunkers in each county like you're talking about. And it is literally just like there'd be one official it's, and then minions, and then he would have the to just... It's nothing shoot. any citizen would plan. It comes, mm -hmm. comes straight from the evil mind of these worst bureaucrats. And mm -hmm. and so, you know, I, th I thought that it would be so good to, you know, actually get people thinking about those or, or get whatever plan is declassified from the Cold War and stuff and get citizens to start discussing it. Because if there's, if there's anything that will make them break faith, anything will make a liberal break faith is with the, with the state, is to know how the state treats you when well, there really well, is well, Sweden, Sweden has sent their disaster plans to every citizen a few years ago. Mm. They have it in there. They've sent them uh, some time when there was some tensions with Russia. Something was happening anyway. But they're in every house. Now, that's Sweden. But if, if you can get your disaster plans from your county council, in any mm. country or in Europe, in any country, the best thing would not be to discuss it. The best thing would be to publish, have it published in the local press. Well, that's where I'm online. going with it, is, 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 is yeah. surface then, because, because the first thing people say is, we don't want this kind of, we don't want to be managed like that in a disaster. Well, that really challenges the state because, because they'd say like, you know, what do they say? It's like, oh, tell us how, how you want to be, you know, managed in a disaster. And we'll see if you can. We can accommodate you, Hampshire, or Kent, or something. It's like they're not going to say that. They they they're in a very difficult spot because because all of their thing is based on we keep power and we're going to grind your face into the dirt to stay in power, even if it's nuclear Armageddon. You say, well, actually, we'd like a reprieve and we'd like to be set free if the government in you know Whitehall goes down the pan. And so it's basically they don't want you to think that way or think it. And it breaks the narrative that people, you know, liberals have is is the social contract that, oh, you know, you can, you know, rape my ass every fucking day, tax me to oblivion, not give me any health care, and keep me working like a wage slave. But you protect me, right? And the government goes, Yeah. And it's a complete lie. They do not nothing. You've seen in a pandemic, they've got no preparedness. Then basically, you you see what happens if uh, you know there's a famine, if there's a war or something. It's like you're out in the cold, and they don't know that. So they say like, what's the government for? We we only have it here for disaster insurance. And you say yeah, and you make the disaster a million times worse. You say thank you, grandma. Now you're an anarchist. 
so it's basically there was you know it's it's very powerful thing I think to expose them and show show what happens and I mean I've seen plans I've had to implement things because I've done weird things and especially technology for what they will deploy in a disaster especially I did stuff with mesh networks assembly of mesh networks with radio so you have these tiny little devices they were called Zigbee devices but they're not anymore the the and and you basically imagine you get these tiny little electronic devices, um, postage stamp size. They they have they're fully powered. They can power off anything. They can basically they can stick to the side of a bridge and get powered from the percussion of the bridge as cars go over them. They they extremely light power. They have little tiny little solar cells can last forever. They yeah basically you have to imagine them sprinkling these things out over a city out of the back of an aeroplane, the thousands and thousands of them, they all link up and form a mesh net net network because they assume the the, the, the the grid and the internet's gonna go down. So these are like ad hoc internets. You won't have access to them. You, your cell phone will go and will go in the first EMP. And this is the stuff they'll do. But what happens when they use those mesh networks for is the stuff of nightmares. It basically, you have to see what happens when, when say, like a bowler and stuff breaks out. It's, it's basically, they form an arm quarantine. Say, if a bowler broke out in in San Francisco, they'd form an arm, you know, an armed cordon at various points that are predefined. Basically, the bridges, okay, <laughs> and then basically they'd have shoot to kill. They would they would bring you some water and food to the perimeter. But they just wait until the disease dies out. There's no functional hospital, no electricity. People will be dying of cholera and you know, diphtheria and stuff and basically typhoid fever because <laughs> nothing would be working. <laughs> and they would just contain you there with you know sandbags and machine guns until basically the disease died out. That, that's the kind of plant. And they, they, there are plenty of things that I told people about. Now they kind of believe me a little bit more. But they really, really do plan to chip you. With, with they get they they really do plan to have a, a vaccine where you have a choice. You have the vaccine and it has a chip and the chip certifies that you had the vaccine, or you go into a quarantine. And quarantine's in a fucking camp, <laughs> FEMA camp. <laughs> FEMA. So you don't realize how devious all these places are. So for example, FEMA camps are are, are nightmarish places. They for I'll just give you an idea of how they work. So, so they have these kind of huts, Nissen huts, you know, prefabricated houses that they will drop in. Right? But, yeah. So they would put them in a big concentration camp, Bob wire fences and stuff like that. But each one of these houses, they're actually made of different types. And the type is designed for how quickly it deteriorates. So they're made out of cornstarch. And so they basically, they, they you know, whoever the FEMA manager, he asked for like, Give me a three-month house and then a six-month house or a year's house. I don't think it only goes up to a year, after a year. And so they designed for the insects and the rain to break them down. And the reason is so that you can't form a permanent settlement. So you, you have to be reliant on them for housing. <laughs> you know, they, won't, they won't let you get hold of corrugated iron and plastic sheeting like you would in, say, uh, in Africa. I'd prefer to be in Africa in that situation because they wouldn't try and contain you. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, yeah, and if there's insurrection and stuff, that's what they'll do. They'll take large sections of the population and just put them in a camp like that. And it will be a fucking death camp. I mean, you you want to see what happens in a camp, camp like that when typhoid breaks out and stuff. It's 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 just so nightmarish. You can barely believe it. And they have plan after plan, city level, basically county level, state level, and federal level. Each one of them is more and more fucking disastrous. So I just wish people knew what, what was coming because everybody believes, oh, this is going to be really bad. But I'm going to, you know, watch it on my widescreen TV with, with you know, Budweiser in my hand. No, you're fucking not. The Daisy people got to, like, smarten up and realize how bad this is going to be. So I think that, you know, I wish that... XR and stuff had done more on that to try and say, because, yeah, the, the best gambit you've got with liberals is to say, you know, they don't, they're not going to fulfill their side of the contract that you've saved your life on. 
And so, yeah. Now, I have a naive question again. Uh, are the, in the U.S., are these different levels of government, do they share with each other the disaster plans or um, is the federal, are the federal bodies keeping that for themselves the, and they will only deploy and roll out and communicate the federal plan once the disaster Yeah, so, so it, it works in, in layers depending on how, as the disaster extends. So if you imagine like a city, like San Francisco or something like that, then then Willie Brown, I can't remember who the mayor is now. So, so at the mayoral level, then basically Willie Brown can declare um, a level of emergency, a city level emergency. And there, there's certain things that he can do according to the Insurrection Act. But depending on how that gets managed, then it would soon fall, fall to the governor of California. And the governor of California is going to work with FEMA. So the federal agency will take over. And then basically they, they will manage it with the, the police and, and emergency services subordinate to that. But hanging in the wings is, is the National Guard. So the, and, and even the, the regular army, the Kazi uh, Komitatus, how do you say that? Yeah. Uh, Kazi Komitatus and stuff like that is, is uh, and the various things in the Insurrection Act where they can actually deploy. Most Americans think, oh, you're not allowed to deploy the military in, in a domestic situation in, in America. Well, not so true. There, there are plenty of, of uh, things in the Insurrection Act for when it can be done. But as, this, as the situation gets worse and worse, so then, then it gets taken out of the hands of each authority. So if you imagine in Katrina, in, in the mayor in New Orleans would have, you know, kind of responsibility for the city police and fire and stuff like that. But, but you know, if, if it got to be, a, you know, a bigger emergency, so statewide emergency, the flavor of it would change very quickly. And at, at some stage, if there are a number of states that, that are involved in a thing, then it, it, it'll go straight to the federal level. And then, then you're not in a very good position because FEMA and stuff manages <laughs> disasters with a gun. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I, I was just thinking, um, yeah, something that, um, yeah, that, that annoys me the way Faulty, you're calling him now, um, he's just so simplistic and when he tries to appeal to young people just says, oh, you know, what's going to happen is there's going to be a war and you know your wife's going to be raped from the table or your you know or your girlfriend but i just that bugs me how he approaches it oh yeah I, your message is yeah way more powerful what you're just talking about you know and you've talked about it before you know you need some more layers there just trying to use this simplistic shock tactic to appeal to young people in his in his current um strategy it's just yeah bugs me yeah, it was the same he did the same before he said you're all heading for annihilation or equivalent of it's like roger like sort it out <laughs> like you yeah, need to but, but you see you see it's it's uh it's it pays to be nuanced and try to be accurate about this kind of thing so that people really see it as a possibility and it's quite easy to do you can read rebecca sonnet and you can see what happened in Sarajevo and in Lebanon and stuff. And it's, it's pretty consistent what people do. I mean, people can fuck it up rather badly, but that's generally because they have warlords and, you know, governments. And, and, and in those situations, they always a proxy in some bigger war like the Cold War. So, you know, it's well worth telling kids about how collapse happens in detail and say, look, if in a place like Britain, what, what it's, it's vulnerable to severe austerity, um, price hikes, insurrection in the, in the streets. So it, it, it looks like the 70s. Pe people will strike. There'll be trash building up on the streets. That'll, that'll lead to, you know, pandemics and typhoid and stuff like that. So you, you, you got to manage a, a, a collapse in Britain will look much like, I think, will look much like the war going into the war there'll be rationing and stuff like that but i i would hate to be in britain in a collapse because it's going to be managed all the way down the road 
I'd rather be in somewhere like Somalia, where, <laughs> where the government collapses early, and then people have options. The, 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 the best option you have in most countries is, is when it becomes a community support operation. And then, yeah. you, you know, if you look at something like Puerto Rico and stuff like that, after the Hurricane Maria, the, the guys realize, at some point, the guys realize the government is fucked. They're not collecting any tax, they've got no resources, and uh, they can't pay anybody. So it's up to everybody else. Then everybody else starts, they, you know, all these people start coming out and guys start wiring up the electrics and stuff, and then you get the volunteerism and stuff. But that only stop, starts when everybody realizes there's no help from the authorities. They, people will wait and, and they, they will give, cause themselves untold trouble because they, they've been conditioned to think that the government's there to help. And it's like, no, it isn't. The government's ability to help you is very, very lim limited. Don't see something like Katrina. And, and you'll see it's like they've got a, one helicopter. <laughs> you know, it's like the, you see, the, you saw that in 9-11. The guys go to the top of the building, of a burning building. You can, cannot do anything stupider than go to the top of a burning building. But they all thought, well, the government's going to put on helicopters. And comes, no, they yeah. fucking aren't. <laughs> so is it the, people have an exaggerated idea of the power of the government, and the government encourages it. But the, the, the <laughs> government encourages the idea that they have power because they, they want to intimidate you, and they want to basically say that they, they're to keep you safe. But both of them are a complete lie. After 9-11, I was in Oregon. And it basically said that everybody was like, okay, well, now we're going to be invaded in the coast. Found out for the very first time that the, the Oregon coast was gu guarded by a single ranger. <laughs> the entire coast, that's like a third of America's western coast, was, was manned by one guy. If terrorists had, you know, come in landing craft, or they could have just turned up and they could have done fuck with. You know, you, you yeah. think, oh, Coast Guard's out there and stuff. No, they got one freaking ship, and it's decommissioned and freaking old. It's like people don't realize that governments don't spend money on disaster preparedness because nobody can see it, and they all believe it's all been done. So you see it with a the pandemic. There was no preparation whatsoever. We know pandemics are coming. Where was all the PPE? <laughs> the guys had nothing. You, so you know can I want you back? Can yeah, I launch yeah. you back for a minute to to what you were talking about some of the uh, uh, Somalia and some of the other countries there where people would probably fare better? I think it was in a talk that Dmitry Olaf did um, where he was comparing uh, the USA and the so uh, well the former Soviet Union and explaining why because he he uh, has lived. I think he had his young. He was uh, spent his younger life in the, in the uh, Soviet Union before he came to America, and he's experienced both society, societies. And he goes backwards and forwards, even now. Uh, but what he was trying to describe was he said that in this condition of uh, collapse, civilizational collapse, um, explaining why people in the USA would fare so much worse. Than in than in his example in in the Soviet Union, they've had uh, and he went through several things. I wish I could remember the full list, but he said it was just simple things like that. Communism uh, had sort of taught people to to somehow or another, you know, not be so individualistic that they got along with each other a little bit better, and so that that means a post post collapse they had a kind of a, a community communal connection that would be very hard to uh, you know re-establish in a place like the states where everybody's terribly independent uh, and he went on to other things like uh, the fact that a lot of people were more accustomed to living in a rural area where they had a little bit of scope to make food um, the fact that they were used to not having such readily disposable consumer goods, so they were accustomed to repairing things and making do. Um, and he went through a whole long list of little things like that, explaining why um, 
uh, you know, j just in that example, explaining why people in, in places like Russia would probably do a lot better after a collapse than people in, in the United States would, yeah. just as a general observation, you know. Yeah, and people were uh, more resilient and hardy in, back in those days. And nowadays, everyone, I mean, look at Britain. I mean, everybody's just infantilized. Everyone just runs. Yeah, well, then, this, is, this is why I really worry about Britain. Because, okay, so the basic thing is, is in a collapse, you don't want, it's like falling off a ledge. You don't want to have a long way to fall. In Africa, you haven't got a long way to fall. In, in some way like New York, you've got a fucking terribly long way to fall. Your lifestyle falling to, you know, kind of African standards is huge. So in America, 3% of the population are invo involved in agriculture. So you don't know fucking you know zero about how to grow an ear of corn. And and you're not going to go out into the fields of, of Idaho and stuff and reap corn and stuff because that corn is inedible. Those GMO crop, crops, you cannot take them in your hand and cook them and eat them. They, they're actually made that way. What they're made to do is to go straight to a factory. The factory breaks them down into about 150 different constituents and they 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 inedible because they made to optimize each one of those 150 processes and so it's it's not actually an edible crop in the fields and americans don't realize that now think in terms of if you're in africa there may be 30 percent 40 percent of people involved in agriculture that means that if you live in a city you've got a grandma who grows <laughs> grows yams in the country and when the shit goes to things go to shit in the city, you go to your one of three or four potential options you have where they go, you know, we told you not to go to the city. Now look. So anyway, have a yam. You but Gary, York, you're, right. you're not gonna do that. You are right, Gary. I remember the list of Dmitry Olov because I read that several years ago. And I think I, I will, if you agree, I, I will co try to contact him and see would he be willing to have a chat. Yeah, with him. I, I remember I, he did that. Uh, somebody was interviewing him and he, he went over some of those points uh, mm -hmm. in one of the talks. And it, uh, I wish I remembered more of it because it, it was it was remarkable, just uh, especially given the sort of prevailing opinion that people in the former Soviet Union still aren't doing very well and and all the rest of it but he said you know once the once uh, the situation changes the tables will be turned and it will, the difference will, will all be the other way they'll be the ones yeah, who are on top and in front you know so anyway I was busy here so so I'll give you another example so go and have a look at Tesco on all the food that that's on a shelf you'll see a lot of it's packaged in glass now, the chances that a glass plant carries on going and starts, keeps jarring up, you know, your mm. your spaghetti sauce and shit like that is as close to zero. So, yeah. so there might be loads of these commodities that they can't ship to you because there are no containers and, and uh, or there's, there's one ingredient or they can't get hold of one thing like a preservative or something like that then they won't last on the shelf, and that'll break the supply chain. There'll be supply chain shocks. So because they have long supply chains and just-in-time delivery, their supply shocks, they kind of what they call them a whip or stuff, and those, those things can be severe because food can spoil in transit and stuff. And so you see it, you can see it now with the vaccines. A lot of the things get spoiled in large batches and stuff like that. But, but okay, now... Um, imagine somebody in Africa. If you go and look at a farm stall, in, or here in Greece, you go you go to the grocery here. Everything's laid out. They're the beans. <laughs> it, it comes from somebody on the island, and then mm. basically the, the butcher. They have a real butcher. The butcher slaughters the goat and the sheep, and they come <laughs> from the island. So it's like they're going to be laughing. But if you if you have it from Tesco's, it might come on a plane from Shanghai. Oh, <laughs> you yeah, fact, because planes are not going to be flying. Yeah, I mean, so, like, like places like London and Birmingham and big cities like that, it'd be a horror show. I mean, it would be a... <laughs> but, you see, but, but you see, people like Boris Johnson and that should be preparing. They know what's coming. 
And what are they doing about it? Absolutely fuck all. They're criminals. They are psychopathic criminals. And the mm. average person doesn't know. It's very basic for what they should be, you know, in America, in Utah, in Salt Lake City, they have warehouses and warehouses of food and provisions and stuff like that. They were used uh, in, in Katrina. Mm. What they, they were they done by the Church of the Latter day Saints, the Mormons, the Mormons. yeah, yeah the Mormons, the disaster preparedness, and America relies on that. <clears throat> Nobody does that in the UK. The UK is prepped to starve and die horribly. Well, the food banks have been bigger and bigger every year, but I mean, yeah, but that relies on mostly donations. I mean, a lot of the supermarkets these days, you can, you know, on your way out, you can donate a tin of beans or whatever to for the homeless and stuff. And they did, I mean, it was interesting. A lot of people said, um, people who were kind of clued in before COVID, they were like, oh, that's weird. Like how they started doing things in the supermarkets before, you know, the lockdown fully started. So clearly the government had been talking to the supermarkets. But yeah, I mean, in London, you go to London, I think even now on the sort of metro size supermarket, there's queues still because they won't let so many people in. So they're already, you know, people are already, um, you know, used to the behavior of, right, you got to get in a queue and you're only allowed so many of this and so many of that. I mean, there's, I think the... Uh, there's not rationing on it now, but there was during the first lockdown and the second lockdown, I think they rationed certain items. Um, but yeah, they're conditioning the people in the cities, so I think, to, to, you know, get in line. You're only allowed this or that, you know. Yeah, um, but just just imagine yeah. when the food delivery doesn't come, all those people yeah, standing right, in line yeah. and doing a food drive. But I wanted to say... On infrastructure and basically planes and ships coming in, and you, you can... You can think of a million scenarios, like basically the one that's just happened, where the ships and planes stop. And basically Britain is in the world of hurt. I mean, yeah, yeah. you know, it, it's not a question of, you know, oh, they will always come and stuff. Other countries could basically pay more. So in other words, there could be a global crisis. There could be a rice crisis or something like that. And everybody will try and get hold of the ships that are now furloughed. And so then basically a country like, it'll be like a vaccine war. You will have a food war and a transport war. And a country like China, who has gold and stuff, will completely outspend Britain. The pound will be worth fuck all. And Boris Johnson mm -hmm. will be begging for some, you know, container line like Mayos to come and bring food aid for Britain. And they'll say, what do you pay with? Well, we got pounds. Say, well, those are fucking worthless. Can you, mm -hmm. can you cough up something worth something? You can't. It, it always baffled me. Yeah, totally. It always baffled me how someone like, uh, I mean, well, he was, you know, he was a proper doomer, wasn't he, in his time, that James Lovelock. And yet he always said, oh, you know, I think Britain will be a lifeboat. It was like, I, I'd, I'd never really bought that either. Um, I think he was, because he was from the war, you know, he was a scientist during the war and he remembers those times. Maybe he was just too old to sort of realise what modern you know, um, just in time delivery system, how we're just so reliant on that now. It's just crazy. There is a lot of local food farmers and, you know, you farm shops and things when you get in the countryside. But yeah, I mean. Uh, yeah, but get 10 million yeah. people in Britain. Uh, uh, it's like how, how many people can get out to the countryside? And anyway, they, they, would, they would start resisting, right? I don't think they would put up with people coming from London to invade their strawberries. Right? Right. <clears throat> so anyway, I think we should stop because Tom is going to need some emergency aid exercises now. <laughs> <laughs> stop about the UK. <laughs> well, get on a fucking bicycle and come to Greece. Yeah, yeah. Ireland. <laughs> I'm on my bicycle. Yeah, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm going to get out. I was I was reading something about, well, it's, I don't know if it's a conspiracy thing, but they said that there's a big shortage of lorry drivers and that's causing the, the delay in the deliveries to uh, supermarkets in the UK. So it's being predicted that it will worsen in the next few weeks. Yeah. Yeah, I hadn't heard that, actually. That's a new one to me. There's just so much news these days. Yeah, that wouldn't surprise me. Um, the supply chains are all messed up. Yeah, you can't get anything like lots of things like consumer goods and everything like plastics and all sorts of stuff. 
there's things that aren't if you go to a shop and you ask about things i know that for sure i think that's across the board but yeah so it's only a matter of time as you say that there'll be other shortages i had noticed a few things on the supermarket shelves as well which aren't there anymore um not nothing major but yeah. That's Brexit. I think I think that's a lot to do with Brexit because um, I've seen it in Ireland too, where we were relying on English um, on English supplies, certain things, and between there was a lapse. Uh, there's still a lapse, but now they're turning to France, Italy, Germany much more for their supplies. But uh, being we're, oh, not, we're not an industrialized country here. There's hardly no industry, and there's enormous percent yeah. of rural people. But for food, I noticed like you. Um, in the supermarket, there was some moments of there's some things that are not, uh, but I think it's Brexit related more than anything yeah, else. Probably, yeah. Before I forget, someone else to think about would be that former diplomat, Khan Ross, the reluctant anarchist, the guy that was doing um, state yeah, building. He's a cool guy. Yeah, he's a cool guy. Yeah, yeah. Interesting yeah, guy. Yeah, he's a very interesting guy. Um, yeah, but oh, one more thing that I want to say about it is. It is worth being nuanced about it because there are upsides as well in collapse and people need to know and think and the youth needs to know and think about that to think about it realistically. So for example, if there was food food shortages in Britain, the nutrition would get a hell of a lot better. There would be fewer people clogging the NHS trying to get wheelchairs because they have premature diabetes. So basically the best thing that could happen in the, in the UK is is a big food shortage, and I don't think people know that. Up to a certain point, basically mm -hmm. Britain can make half its food, but it, it it would it would actually serve Britain quite well to halve its food intake. But mm -hmm. people don't totally know that. Totally agree. Totally yeah. agree with what you say. I've I've often thought of that, and I've often I've often I'm observing. You know, I, I grew up in a country where food is like a religion, you know, France, where people, you know, have a lot of products and a lot of variety of things. But my mother was English and uh, I saw the difference. I, I was going back and over to the two countries and I saw how things evolved through the through the years in, uh, in, in terms of nutrition and, and uh, how people were feeding themselves and what was happening. Because on both sides of my family, there was doctors too in the UK and in France. And I could, I was listening to their stories about the emergence of diabetes type two and and things like that. And it is, it is so obvious that what we talk, what we think is a normal um, diet, and what is a normal meal, and what is even, you know, is 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 totally crazy. And I think that in collapse, suddenly you're going to realize that you can live on much less than you think. That you don't, you don't. This, the, I could say 80% of what you're eating is just not necessary. It's cultural. It's, I mean, I've seen that in France because, I mean, lots of the, the, the decorum in the meals were about, you know, the, I'm, not, I'm not denying that it's a fantastic uh, cuisine and everything, but it's, it's just, I, I heard stories from my family during the war because my parents, um, my father and grandmother lived during the German occupation and they knew what it was to have tickets and rations. And I, I heard all those stories because I was only born 10 years after the end of the wo World War II. So I know what they were living on. I heard about nettle soups before they were, they were fad in the, in the, you know, the, the, the new age kind of thing. I heard about foraging because they had to. And I, I also saw, um, the the health and the strength of the people of that generation starting to degrade immensely as soon as as food started to flow again so you know i think you're absolutely right you collapse has got lots of lots of lots of good sites lots yeah yeah it has but people need to explore them and you can do it if you if you study what happened in sarajevo and stuff but the yeah that i'm i'm in a lot of ways, I'm sorry this this COVID thing hasn't been worse because if few people died, but there was more social disruption, uh, people would start to build social networks, and all the, the social networks have broken down in in the UK. For example, you know, you, you just send grand to a home and stuff, and it's like a home's a commercial organisation. A financial collapse might make a lot of homes, <laughs> uh, you know, because people have all their all their savings in in you know pensions and stuff like that in the in the UK in 401ks 
Now, mm -hmm. they, in the UK, I mean, in the US, they're all based on the stock market. If there's a major financial collapse, all these old people won't have a bean. That means all those for-profit healthcare places close. They, they don't run on air. So what it means is Grand's going to have to come home. She's going to have to come home to some little woke twerp that's, um, you know, self-obsessed and works in the city. And it's like, well, first that's going to go is your metrosexual little hipster life is going to go down the toilet because you're going to have to look after Gran when she's got Alzheimer's. So wake up, assholes. That's, you know, if you want to be woke, think no more coffees at home looking after the old folks like you should have been, you fucking self-obsessed little shits. And, mm -hmm. you know, Alan should be going and saying that to people and, and shocking them because they need to be shocked. They need to be shocked out of this, this delusion that they're in. And so, yeah, it, it, but, but the, what they'll find is their life will improve if they get out of the coffee shop and fucking eat their Apple iPhone and go home and look after Graham. They will, their yeah. lives will actually improve. Yeah, that's a good point. It needs to be, yeah, you need to shock them, but then give them the good news about how the story could be, you know, post that. Or, or just to highlight where we're at. Like, that's exactly it. Like, in the UK, it's, it's terrible. It's mixed. Like, it's, just mixed. it's, it's mixed blessings, but you get what you fight for. Yeah. None of this shit's going to be handed on a plate. And all the part of, part of the depression... And, and the psychological collapse that the youth is, is a, they're just giving up. Part of that is, is a kind of a sel uh, selfishness. So if, if they know that it's a mixed person and, and a helplessness because they don't know how to do anything for themselves. So the fact that if things are bleak, they don't know how to change that. So the, but, the, you can encourage them to say that it's a mixed bag, but you definitely only get what you fight for. So you better start. Uh, it's and you know this this whole thing where it's like, oh, we can't have a techno society, so we're fucked. And it's like, no. <laughs> Between there and there is your entire life. <laughs> There's meaning, existence. There's, most people live their life in the zone that you dread. This yes, because yeah, I think of how long this all this technological gadgets have been around. Like you said, even electricity, even cars, um, refrigeration. That's probably just in the last century or so. So our elders lived lives of, um, you know, like however they live their lives without all this. Uh, technological improvements. And also may I say that I used to, yeah, follow Dmitry Orlov and the other peak oil bloggers. So I'm familiar with what he said. There was another blogger too, and she was uh, in favor of, um, you know, like being resilient in the sense of gardening, trying to feed yourself. And she said too that before collapse, one must prepare oneself to already accept that I will have to eat this these vegetables or these potato or whatever train the children to do that which kind of reminds me of what lord hugh has been saying all along learn to let go like in your mind let go that you know i will not be having this lattes or this avocado toasts and mm. yeah, get your palate used to eating uh whatever's natural vegetables it, it, uh, it, whatever it, it grows in the it, it worries me the, the adapt, that kind of adaptation and that is, is because what I see people doing is they're developing this, what they think they developing a resilience and stuff like that. So then they start doing, you know, victory gardens and stuff and they're convincing themselves that that kind of prepping means that they have an edge and they can survive and stuff. But I, yeah. I think it's a very dangerous mindset to get into. The, the proper mindset in, in, to get into is say, you cannot really tell how it goes down. What's dangerous about that, that thing is where everybody says, oh, this we're all doomed, let's do permaculture, is you gotta be very, very fucking careful. Because you start doing permaculture and it becomes a delusion. 
where, where you going down to the local food store to get your fertilizer and shit and that all that shit's not going to be there it was just exactly the thing that we said <laughs> i was trying to get to with kevin you remember when he said that oh you yeah. know there's a little old lady with a garden just down there and i said you oh know, i see yeah. just, gardens are magic and they just ma magical little squares where you know things pop out of to eat and i said like Oh, really? So where does she get her fertilizer? Oh, from rice husks. Yeah. Where are you going to get fucking rice husks in a famine, idiot? <gasps> oh, you mean I won't be doing little fucking vegetable gardens? No, not if you're feeding them off rice husks. So basically, yeah, but... don't assume that you can get a garden going in a little urban setting that, that basically is self-sustaining if there's no if there's famine. Imagine yeah, but, all the garden shops are closed and shit. You, a, little, a little remark from a gardener: permaculture doesn't rely on fertilizer. That's the okay, thing. okay, okay, okay. But so you know what I mean. It's a kind of. A, it's a yeah, kind of a, it's yeah, a, yeah, okay, it's regenerative. It, yes, it's regenerative. Okay, yeah. okay, yeah. okay it's maybe fine. organic. You meant if organic. It's it can organic, be organic. Okay, but, yeah, but organic permaculture is not out of the woods. You see, basically, it's it's still it's plants need food, and so basically, you you still basically need some some nutrients. You can't you can't just go on forever with without uh, basically yes, having some input. If you, you plant if you plant perennials and you. And if you uh, don't plant with the idea of having a surplus and you you use nature and you forage, you can you can have something that is that is regenerative constantly. If you if you but if you get used to as as uh, you were saying earlier that to, to to do with what you have and to to have your palate a bit used to things that might not be familiar, uh, there is possibilities if the climate doesn't degrade too fast in areas where you live. To, to have yeah, a no, no, I know, I know it's possible, but, but what I'm talking yeah. against is the delusion. So oh, yeah. basically, you know, people that have like a market garden in Battersea, they have a communal garden in Battersea, and then they think, oh, well, they're okay for the famine. Yeah. No. I know some kids in Battersea that will have your tomatoes away long before you get all of them, Grandma. So it's basically, you know, it's just not realistic. And and you see, they, I feel that they, they're they causing themselves unnecessary pain and not getting into the right mindset. The real mindset you should be in is you just don't really know. No one really knows how, how it goes down. So you you can you can find out about other people's experiences but and you can guess what, what it's going to be like in Britain. But on, on the whole... It's it's better to be grounded and realistic and and know when you you're heading for a lot of stuff. You don't want to be having hope. In. There are too many people that, that think they are out of the system and having hope. And it's like don't delude yourselves. The system will come and find you, especially in collapse. It's one of those problems with all the the libertarians, like you were talking about earlier, like Mike Maloney and all the gold bugs and the Austrian people and they keep talking about oh you know having a bit of food and having a bit extra and stuff i mean most of them aren't talking about you know building a bunker and having a load of guns and stuff but they're still i mean mike maloney particularly is on about i bought some land and i got my tesla batteries and over in where is he he's in puerto rico or somewhere and you're like oh jeez <laughs> but he's yeah so they're, they're, they're sort of like, yeah, we're going to ride it out. They're going to have their little a bit of paradise and everything will be going they, to shit they, around. They might, they might, though. They might, yeah. though, you see. You see, I, I mean, if you have lots of gold and silver on your own island, I would say you're going to do pretty fucking well. Yeah. <laughs> I think you could outlast And see. vodka, supposedly, because it, uh, it can be traded. <laughs> Yeah, but you have to be aware of the, you have to be aware of the pirates. <laughs> Don't the pirates, go yes. the gold and pirate. I can't understand all these people shouting with my silver, my gold, and advertising it everywhere and stuff. They don't realize that in collapse you're going to see much more of the black flag going up, you know, in the skull and bones. They don't <laughs> don't realize that, you know. The... <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah, but. Yeah, but they can survive some scenarios like that. So, for example, if you're in Venezuela and you had a whole pot of gold and silver, you would own the whole country now. So mm. it's like 
there was some guy, I didn't meet him, but a friend of mine met him, uh, went down there just, just after it. And uh, he was a businessman and he, he was forward thinking. And he went and bought a whole lot of railway tires, basically railway, uh, what do you call them? Sleep trucks. No, 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 no. Yeah, when he bought a whole lot of railway trucks because they were iron. So he filled his back, <laughs> back garden with, you know, two stories of just iron. Mm. And that, that was extremely good investment. It went up, you know, thousands and thousands of percent. So, so if you're, <laughs> if you're stacking silver or something, you, yeah. you, you, you want to you want to keep it quiet. You don't want the whole neighbor. You basically, I think one of these things is these gold bugs go around saying, no, no, I'm in the gold and silver, and they're telling all their friends. <laughs> and it's like, not a good idea. <laughs> keep, keep still. But, um, the, yeah. But you can survive some scenarios like that pretty well. So, but And, and you do. You've got a lot of hiccups. But the, the general failing of that mindset is the guys don't, uh, they're not uh, prepped for a long haul, 20 years like that. So that, that kind of thing, not many people are set up to, to last 20 years. Mm. So, well, anyway, that's a good thing to end on, I guess. Mm. Oh, yeah. It's getting, getting late. Okay. All right. Well, should we just pause quickly on the way up? Mm -hmm. All right. Still. Bring your attention behind your eyes. Become aware of your senses and rest. Well, hopefully there's no collapse this week. <laughs> See you. Goodbye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, are you recording? The... Yeah, I'm going to stop recording now. Okay. Goodbye. Right. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you.